Now, if you thought that after his comprehensive rout at the Supreme Court, Atiku Abubakar would appear to be defeated, demoralized and exhausted, then think again. Because it was a defiant Atiku Abubakar who stood in front of the cameras today as the confident leader of the opposition and launched a withering attack on the Supreme Court, the President, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, his APC party, and those he said were responsible for electoral heists and who were undermining the will of the people and illegally holding Nigeria by the jugular. And he talked about the restructuring reforms that were needed to make Nigeria more democratic. For as long as I breathe, I will continue to struggle with other Nigerians to deepen our democracy and rule of law. I will continue to work for the kind of political and economic restructuring that the country needs to reach its true potential. That struggle should now be led by the younger generation of Nigerians who have even more at stake than my own generation. <laughs> Firstly, we must make electoral voting and coalition. Members of our National Assembly here present, we must make electronic voting and collation of results mandatory. We don't want to see any human being handling our results, whether at the polling units, at the ward, at the local government. Or at the, we should all be able to stay in our homes and look at the television as the television is putting our results. Secondly, our members of the National Assembly, we must provide that all litigation arising from a disputed election must be concluded before inauguration of a winner. Please, I beg of you. This was the case in 1979. I don't know how we came to this present situation. Atiku Abubakar. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now in the studio by the Deputy National Publicity Secretary of the People's Democratic Party, or PDP, Ibrahim Abdullahi. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Thank you for having me. So, is it over for Atiku Abubakar and his ambition to be President of Nigeria? And that cannot be said. That cannot be correct. Uh, by his admission, he's about just starting, because someone who says he's going to continue strengthening the system through the younger generation. Political participation does not require an individual in, him, in himself, you know, to keep struggling and, and, and obtain the office. For Atiku Abubakar, he's been a serial contestant, you will agree, and it's been 40 years, you know, in the trenches. So, and he's healthy. I like it at the background, how you say it, confidently and courageously. He stood before the cameras and addressed a, a, a country uh, that is demoralized, a country that is uh, in, in, in gloomy mood, a country that has lost hope, albeit temporarily, depending on what situation we'll throw up tomorrow. But um, I will tell you, Atiko Abubakar is just about starting. He's confident, he's defiant, he is prepared, and he can get it done, if not through him, through other people. Well, I, I but, mean, I say this because in his speech, which we all heard today, he said that for him, this phase of the work is done. And he suggested uh, rather ambiguously that the struggle should now be led by a younger generation of Nigerians who have more at stake than his generation. I mean, it sounds like he's bowing out no, it's not and is unlikely to try again for the top job in 2027. You know, that's not the import of the statement. What he meant is that they have more stake, and you will agree with him truly that the younger generation should be having more stake. Well, in that case, he bows out and let them come in and try and take over the running of the country. That is not what it implies. If the system throw him up again another time, which is a possibility, you will agree, because he's a Democrat. How old is he now? A worker is uh, 78. Right. So by 2027, he'll be in his 80s. Yes. And if he has one term, he'll be in his mid We have someone 80s. that is older than him and handling a more, you know, uh, 
developed democracy. The president of the United States is today older than him. The one before this present one, uh, Donald Trump, was older than him. And so it, it, it doesn't follow. Once there's a functional system and functional institution, which is at the cost of what he has been talking about, then it, it doesn't require the age. The age is also uh, uh, a number. Yeah, like but the whole point of his argument is that Nigeria doesn't have functional institutions. And the more reason he's fighting for one to be in place. Right. Now, one of his headline recommendations was around the concept. We didn't hear it there, but he talked about the concept of rotational presidency, which would give a single term of six years to each geopolitical zone. I mean, that would be a landmark reform, and that would constitute fundamental restructuring structuring, wouldn't it? Mm. How far is Mr. Atiku and the PDP prepared to run with that? Yes, of course, uh, the party is admonished to go in that direction. Atiku Abubakar is one of uh, the party faithfuls and is a staunch member. He's a leader of the party, our presidential uh, candidate until uh, recently after the verdict of the Supreme Court, a former vice president of the country. You will agree a dogged fighter, one who has carved a niche for himself and has stamped his feet on democratic waters, so firmly that he will continue to assert relevance in the annals of Nigerian history. Whether you like him or not, it goes without saying. And for him to have said that the best way to address the problem is by ensuring that we have a single time of six years, it's an informed decision. And the party has resolved to go into uh, the, you know, the thinking corner. And on the table now, we have taken that as one of the you know, uh, robust uh, advice that we have obtained from him to see how we will inculcate the idea and then push through our members of the National Assembly who at that level would be able to push it through. And if it you know, favors the, the, the Nigerian uh, legislature, mm. then the better for Nigeria. And you know that would strengthen democracy, if you, uh, if you ask me, because uh, we've seen- And make every part of this of country, the country feel, feel involved. involved. Because after right. trying this same experiment over and over, he referenced this has been the case since 1979, the Second Republic, and today is uh, 2023. We're still doing one thing and we're not getting you know, a, a different result. I think it's about time we, we rescheduled the way things are done and we then revolve it and bring a better decision. Mm. So uh, the, the, the other geopolitical zones who feel alienated or denied the opportunity, if it is constitutional, that it will be rotated you know, amongst these uh, six geopolitical zones and single term of it, everyone will be patient and it will reduce the acrimony and the tension that comes with every election year. You know, and Nigeria will be the better for it, if you ask mm. me. And in another withering criticism of the way things are, he talked about the need for all litigation. We heard him saying that there arising from a disputed election to be concluded before the inauguration of the winner, which, as he said, was the case in 1979. I mean, why is it that Nigeria, I mean, you're a Nigerian politician. Sure. <laughs> Why is it that Nigeria always regresses and doesn't seem to progress? I mean, Mr. Atiku suggested that it was akin, akin, akin to asking thieves to keep their loot and use it to defend themselves while the case of rob robbery is being decided. I mean, I, I thought that was a brilliant analogy. Mm. Uh, yeah, of course it is. Because uh, if you ask me, I, don't, I will not see any reason why you will expect this judgment. We thought the Apex Court was going to be um, the, the, the basin of democracy, as we have always seen it. In the last uh, judgment uh, of the Court of First Instance, before we headed to Supreme Court, we describe the judiciary as the sanctuary, and that was the same article our worker saying, is a sanctuary of democracy. And we thought they would be courageous enough in the face of ample and overwhelming evidences presented before it to say that they have not seen anything wrong throughout from the qualification, from pre-election matters, from the, the perjury, from the forgery, from the, oh God, name it, from even, even the conduct of the electoral you know, uh, uh, exercise proper. I mean, a, a, a political, I mean, an electoral umpire in the middle of the game changing the rules, things they have assured us, including going to the Chatham House by Professor Yakubu after touring the whole world and giving us confidence that we're going to have 100% electronically driven process. And then you're coming to tell us in the middle of the match that you have, you're experiencing technical but, but you do realize, and I know you have a lot of political experience and some legal experience, sure. that the evidence that what you're calling evidence is purely anecdotal. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a court of law, the, their job is to look at the letter of mm -hmm. the law. 
mm. as contained in the Act, mm. as contained in the Constitution, mm. and say, by doing this, ABC, yeah. did they violate that letter of the law? Not the anecdotal evidence that you're talking about. I mean, it may offend public opinion, yeah. and it certainly does. And I mean, I, I was certainly one of the people who felt offended mm. by it. Yeah. But that is not the letter of the law, is it? No, it's not. But one of the things so I want you, to... you should have submitted the kind of evidence that would tip the balance in your favor with regard to that letter of the law. You see, the, the whole thing is premeditated, it's predetermined. We went to... Well, the, that's purely speculative. Well, if you call it, but the truth of the matter is that if you conduct public opinion, you go across the length and breadth of the country, even a secondary school student of moderate intelligence could rattle off dozen slogans about the mess that Nigeria has found itself with the judiciary. It is so terrible now that the military is not even the anathema to Nigeria's democracy. It is the judiciary who sits in its comfort and determines the fate of politicians at the, at the detriment of, uh, of constitutional democracy. For the apex court to ratify this judgment brazenly in the broad daylight and look at Nigerian face and say nothing went wrong. In some part they said yes, a lot of things went bad, but they were not substantial enough to invalidate the election. It's just like Mr. Charles running into a traffic light that you have not stopped by a red signal and you pass it and no accident happened, then, then you're not wrong. It's not an offense. Is that what the judiciary is telling us today? It is saying that, yes, there were malfeasance, there were uh, uh, electoral malfeasance, but not substantial enough to invalidate the election. That is an admission of failure on the part of the judiciary. That is a shame. I can tell you today Nigeria has been thrown, the, the, the nail, finally democratic nail has been placed on the coffin of constitutional democracy. In, in, in other words, your argument, I mean, we're not going to beat this to death because obviously it's already been beaten to death. Yes. So there's no point, you know, kicking a dead horse. But the, the point really that I understand that you're making is that you want elections in this country to be held up to the highest levels of propriety exactly and that if even a marginal uh, marginal evidence is presented suggesting that there was something untoward yeah. that might have violated the democratic rights of nigerian people mm. that that would be substantial enough in your assessment yeah. for serious questions to be raised about that election Yes, exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that uh, the judiciary was expected, at least by way of pronouncement, to say that, yes, the election did not comply substantially with the extant mm. provisions of our laws. And on that basis, on they that should that have basis, taken action. Yeah, now right. you nullify this election and say, yes, a lot of things went wrong. All the mm. promises that we gave Nigeria, all the pledge that we gave the international community and the Western world, and the monies that we sank in this process, and the hope that we dashed for Nigerians, I mean, we cannot allow so, the system... So basically, to if the... I mean, there's, you know, over 178,000 polling booths in yes. Nigeria. If yes. you submitted evidence yeah. suggesting that in a thousand polling booths, I'm just giving you an example, yeah. that there were irregularities. Yeah. You think that on that basis, the, the Supreme Court, bearing in mind the financial costs and all the other things, yes. and the number yes. of votes within that 1,000, those 1,000 polling groups, the Supreme Court should annul the election. Yes, of course, it should annul the election. That is just one of the many things that we presented before the court. What about the 25% FCT? That has not been determined. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a fairly clear issue. It is where, not. Where you either go one way or, or you don't. the other. Yeah. But this you are even saying, substantial irregularities that has rendered this election the greatest malfeasance in human history. We are becoming a laughing stock in Western world. You're looking at these people. Are you truly serious about this democracy? Well, it doesn't look like that. I mean, Olaf Schultz was here just a day ago um, coming to not only congratulate uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, but to discuss going into business with, with Nigeria. Of course, you don't expect them not to promote their interests simply because we have become a laughing stock in the Western world. International observers who came here said this much. I'm not the one saying it. They said right. it, fall, it fell short of you know, substantial compliance. That election was nothing 
uh, short of a broad day robbery against Nigerians. And it is unfortunate. It's not against PDP. It's against Nigeria mm. and constitutional democracy. So, so is the PDP now going to, I mean, based on what we saw today, um, which, as I said, was a very impressive speech from Atiku Abubakar, is the PDP now going to properly constitute itself into a strong opposition that will keep the heat on the government, perhaps in concert, I mean, I don't know, with other opposition parties, which would presumably make you, as a collective force, much stronger? Of course, yes. Uh, to start with, it's a political party that has survived, you know, all the uh, transformations that we have seen in other political parties it's uh, made. At the formation in 1998, you will recall there were five political parties. Mm. None of them is bearing the same name. They have either transmuted to other political, others have merged, others have changed name, logo, and all this thing. PDP still remain the same political party. It has continued to divide. It is the elephant in the house. And I am telling you, I'm reassuring you, even after the judgment of the Supreme Court, we have had nothing less than 10 meetings to that, towards uh, achieving this objective that mm. you have just stated. We are going to provide the desired opposition against the government. We are going to stand with Nigerians. We are going to ensure that Nigerians continue to lean on PDP, you know, for political orientation and sensitization of the issues ahead. Thereby also criticizing and then commending government. We are not all about criticism. We will commend them where they take, you know, uh, mm. informed decisions. But where they renege or where they, they derail, they are going to receive it in the PDP. And we are getting stronger. And I agree with you, we are going to go into partnership with some political parties that have similar ideologies. We have seen how uh, opposition suffers in, in, in uh, African democracy. So going it individually will not be in the interest mm. of you know, Nigerians. So we are looking into all of these options. Uh, they are all in the table. And in the fullness of time, I can tell you that we will come with informed decisions that would salvage Nigerians from the, this twin malady of hunger and poverty mm. and despondency well, I mean, in the land. Certainly the picture. Um, that Atiku Abubakar painted in that speech of Nigeria was bleak. Yes. I mean, a world of declining democracy, a dying economy, a fading spirit, and a sense of youth hopelessness. Yes. I mean, in, in those circumstances, he himself must be a disappointed man. I mean, feeling a sense of defeat and quite demoralized, although he didn't come across that way. Mm -hmm. I mean... Yes, uh, of course, he's been part of the system. He has told you some of the struggles that he had to bear to, to get to the level that we are today. He was one person who lost at a first one swoop, you know, 11 policemen guarding him in his residence in Kaduna. That was targeted against him. He was one person who had to leave this country at some point for nine months exile, you know, against the military. He thought at that time and those who joined him in that struggle against uh, uh, the, the, the military statocracy that we had was to put in place a democratic system that would be the pride of all. And because Africa looks at Nigeria when it sneezes, I mean, uh, every other country in Africa catches cold. So we were looking at the possibilities of ensuring that Nigeria gets it right for the benefit of Africa and for benefit of our civilization. But it's unfortunate the hope of Nigerians have been dashed so cheaply in the way the judiciary has you know, chosen to do. Mm. And it's sad, not just to PDP, it's sad to Nigerians, it's sad to Africa, and it's unfortunate. It is one of the worst things that will happen to human civilization. So if indeed um, Atiku Abubakar is bowing out of the race for the presidency, or at least is considering it, and doesn't intend to put himself forward in 2027, what will his political legacy be? How will history judge him? Of course, history will be fair to him. You did hear him say that much. I told you earlier that he has stamped his feet on the sands of time so firmly that he will continue to assert relevance in the annals of democratic history. But I mean, he Nigeria. has a few skeletons in his closet. It doesn't, nobody exists without one. There's not, the last time I checked, an individual who does not have the skeleton. And it's relative, depending on what you mean by that. But Atiku Abubakar has remained the one person who has defied the odds, fighting through tick and tin to strengthen democracy through the courts. He said he could have taken the easy way out, but he chose to go the long way, and he has consistently maintained this. And this has been for the benefit of democracy in Africa. Don't forget, he was one person who had to even disagree with his boss, the then President Olushagun Obasanjo, who could not get him out of the way, and through the courts. So Atiku Abubakar is one person who believes in constitutional democracy. This one that we have just lost, sadly, is not one thing that would deter him. If he doesn't get to run again in 2027, you can right. rest assured that he has developed enough followership and he has 
strengthened the system. He has already enriched the, you know, the, the, the political waters such that he will just sit by proudly and, and continue to dish instructions. Right. And, and, and what about the PDP itself? I mean, losing every presidential election since 2015, divided down the, the middle by the trauma of internecine strife. I mean, where does the party go from here? Because Atiku has left you, your party, more divided now than it was when he started making a bid to be the PDP's presidential candidate, hasn't he? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, well, for the PDP, you rest assured, Mr. Charles, PDP is going to come renewed, stronger. Like I told you earlier, it's still the only political party that has remained with the texture, the color, the name, and the vibrancy that it came up with in 2019. We still have about the same number of governors today uh, uh, with the ones we had before we went to poll in February. So give and take, we are back in the cooking room. We're trying to see how we could, you know, dot the I's and, and cross the T's to ensure that where we got it wrong, things that were done wrongly, the steps that were not supposed to be taken and that were taken, you know, are redeemed for the benefit of the party. Already we are spending nocturnal nights to that effect to see if we can bring, you know, uh, a committed, mm. you know, uh, leadership in place and a more patriotic followership which will be inspired by the leadership towards ensuring that uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. But certainly PDP will give you, you know, that confidence that you require and there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I mean, you, you certainly sound like a very measured and very competent young man. Perhaps you should consider putting your, <laughs> your candidacy forward. Well, if that is what will favor the party, it will be in my interest. But I see more qualified people. I would be playing the supportive role from the sidelines. And by the grace of God, we will come triumphant once again. And, and, and to quickly respond to something mm. you said, there's still not a political party that has lasted in power as long as PDP did. We were there for 16 years. These are people are just eight years old at most. So mm. the fact that we have lost in 2015 and now 2019 and 2023, they're still not matching up with PDP 16 years in power. And if you take the first three years, four years of President Olusha Gona Basanja, it's more important and more you know, uh, beneficial to Nigerians than this Western six, I mean, eight years plus of the APC, subject to your confirmation, by the way. Well, I, I can't confirm or deny it, mm -hmm. but I just want to thank you very much indeed for mm -hmm. coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Ibrahim Abdullahi is the Deputy National Publicity Secretary of the People's Democratic Party. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you.